Good morning. Take our seats. We have some more people coming in. I'm Richard Garassi, uh, president of Wagner College and vice uh, chair of the AACNU board. Let me welcome you to this wonderful session by the New American College Universities presenting the Ernest, Bo Ernest L. Boyer Award, uh, which was an annual award we give. Now, let me just start by saying I was a prisoner of war in Catholic school from elementary school <laughs> through high school. So I am liberating you in an act of rebellion from this ridiculous European carryall we're carrying around our necks <laughs> so we can see the beautiful clothes that you're wearing. And I'm taking this off. So you have my permission now. Uh, let me just say a word for those of you who are um, unfamiliar with Ernest Boyer, and I, maybe some of the younger people in the room do not know who Ernest Boyer was. Uh, Ernest Boyer, in addition to being the Chancellor of the State of New York and the U.S. Commissioner of, Higher Educa of Education under J uh, Jimmy Carter uh, and President of the Carnegie Foundation, was a remarkable, transformative leader in every way in which uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin talked about a leader last night, if you were at that talk. That's who Ernie Boyer was. He was a graceful, dignified, committed, engaged, substantive public intellectual who was deeply committed to transformative education from K all the way through 16. He deeply believed in liberal education, but also in professional education. And uh, he understood the relationship between the two at a time when that relationship was seen as uh, completely unfathomable. And I'll just tell you one quick story um, about my own personal experience with Ernie. Uh, I was a young professor at St. Lawrence University. Some people think when you're president, you were born as president. No, no, we were just like all of you out there and, and had just more neurosis than the rest of you. That's why we ended up here. Our toilet training wasn't as effective as your toilet training, so we ended up as presidents, let me tell you. <laughs> but I was a young professor at St. Lawrence University, and we were putting together a very controversial program called the First Year Program, which was a living and learning program. This is in 1987. And uh, this was to take all first year students and put them into what we now call residential colleges. And they would have a year long course around the enduring questions of the human experience taught as an interdisciplinary multi-team course by all the, by the uh, tenured faculty who chose to be in it. Um, about a third of the faculty joined this new adventure, which is now 30 years old at St. Lawrence and still one of their hallmark programs. A third of the, other, a third of the faculty thought it was the devil incarnate. Uh, and would, would stake their entire career to defeating this from ever being launched. And another third uh, were not aware this was all going on. <laughs> and <laughs> life in the university. And um, so anyway, we did a lot of planning and organizing to launch this thing. It didn't have a lot of preparation behind it uh, in terms of planning. But um, I invited, as the new director of this program, I was a tenure professor and had done a lot of things with faculty council and tenure promotion committees, so I had a little bit of standing. Um, I invited Ernest Boyer to come all the way up to St. Lawrence University, two and a half hours north of Syracuse, if he would come to help us be the inaugural speaker as we launched this as the semester began. And this was for all first year students. We took all, this is 1987, we took all first year students out of whatever residence halls they would have been in and put them in co-ed residence halls with their teaching classrooms in the same building and faculty teaching in the residence halls. So it was quite a change. So Ernie came, Ernest came, and you know, he was this luminary figure. He had just written this book called College. If you haven't ever seen this book, it's something you want to look up, which he gave a kind of a complete breadth and width of what a college should look like. It looked a lot like a liberal arts college, but he meant all colleges and universities. And everything from admissions all the way through to alumni affairs and all the curricular pieces and everything else, he really tackled the issue deeply. So he came and he presented himself just as Doris Kearns Goodwin presented, you know, the best of leadership. He was graceful, he was thoughtful, he was humorous, he was self-depreciating, but he was deadly serious about the work we were doing and the importance of that work as a model for others. And he just lifted the entire experience in the institution to a different plateau by the way he presented it. And that's who Ernest Boyer was, and that's why we recognize him in, 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 throughout higher education. We particularly recognize him in New American Colleges because he, in many ways, was the founder of this organization called New American Colleges, which started this way. In 1995, at this very meeting, AAC and U, 
Ernest had just written a, an article and others had followed about these small private comprehensive, where liberal arts colleges were now small comprehensives, which they referred to as the ugly ducklings of higher education. They weren't liberal arts colleges, they weren't community colleges, they weren't research universities, uh, they weren't state or regionals. They didn't fit quite easily into any of these categories. But these were institutions that had professional, professional programs and deeply committed to the liberal arts at the same time, and they had what were they, we would now call civic engagement programs, and they were committed to their place. Uh, and that this combination of things was really, really important, and they were committed to active learning and what we now call integrated learning. So we identified this as a group, and out of that formed the New American Colleges, which I think were 12 when they started. Some of those are still in, others have moved on. And now we are 25 institutions uh, which are committed to those very values. Um, just recently, William Sullivan wrote a book called The Power of Integrated Learning, which highlighted these 20 institutions and the way in which we tackle integrated learning across a whole series of domains. Uh, so we give this award out every year. You have on your table uh, some information about the award and who has received it, uh, Sandy Aston, uh, Carol Schneider, and others. So it's, a, it's the highest award that we can give as an organization on behalf of higher education. And this year, we're pleased to give it to Jose Antonio Bowen, president of Goucher College. Many of you know his work, Teaching Naked. Um, and you, what you probably don't know, I've discovered in reading his biography in the last couple of days, is that he, as a musician, was also a chronicler of what we used to call in my neighborhood cool jazz or West Coast jazz, if you like. Chet Baker and Miles Davis and Dave Brubeck and Bill Evans and others. If you know this music, this is a beautiful music of the American experience. And, um, but he is committed to a kind of educational model I think we, many of us in this room celebrate. And he really has built it around the notion of not being captives of technology, but using technology outside the classroom and really spending time with our students and building relationships. He has the three R's, which he will talk about, I'm sure, relationships, resilience, and reflection, which are an essential part of, the, of his argument about where we, we should be going and what we should be celebrating and investing in in higher education. So without further ado, I'd like to bring Jose Antonio Bowen up, give him this wonderful award. Congratulations. Thank you. So the award, the award is in this box. It may be an empty box. It is modern higher education. I'm not sure. But no, there is a beautiful globe in here. I'll, I'll give this to Michelle to hold for you while you give your okay. Thank, Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you to the New American Colleges and Universities. I'm, uh, I'm very honored, very humbled. I, uh, as I was telling Richard before, I, I do feel a bit like um, one of my mentors, uh, Dave Brubeck, on that day when he was uh, on tour with Duke Ellington. And uh, they, the buzz was, who is going to be the next? Louis Armstrong had been on the cover of Time Magazine. And so who is the next jazz musician who would make the cover of Time Magazine? And of course, it should have been Duke Ellington. Um, but there was this white guy named Dave Brubeck, and so Dave was very sensitive to this, and they were on tour together, and so one morning he got a knock on the door, and he opened the door, and there's Duke Ellington, um, and he holds up Time Magazine, and it's, it's Dave Brubeck on the cover. And it was that mixture of emotions of, wow, I'm so excited, um, thank you very much, and wow, there were so many other more deserving people uh, than me uh, at the same time, and it should have been you. Um, so also for all of you, uh, thank you. I know so many of you are doing spectacular work in this area. Uh, so uh, on your behalf and on behalf of everybody who works at, at Goucher, where we've been doing lots of wonderful things, um, thank you, I, I appreciate it. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about my, my current thinking, um, share some examples from what we're doing at, at Goucher, and, uh, and then take some questions and hopefully toss out a couple of new radical ideas. Um, but we start with one that's not so radical, <coughs> which is that um, learning is really about change. I always start here, especially with parents. Um, this is not indoctrination. Uh, this is the idea, though, that, that right, just, just the, the way that learning works. Uh, when you learn something new, it should change the things that you thought you knew. 
right? That it's the relationship of the, of the, in, the, the information, the facts, and all that stuff in your brain and the processes um, that really have to change uh, in order for it to actually be learning. Otherwise, it's just more stuff, right? Um, and my example of this, um, some of you will, will not get this, but if, if you're old enough to remember car keys, <laughs> right? Remember cars that had keys and you put the key in the Nixon, you, it actually was a lock and you turned the key and the car started. Right? So, of course, I think of this, like most older people, as a car key, right? And the children say, no, Dad, <laughs> right? It's not, right? It, and, of course, I, get, I take it out of my pocket, I get in the car, and I look for where to put it. And I think I toss it in the other seat, that's not good, right? Um, I try to, no, it doesn't fit in there, right? Because it's not a car key. It's a personal identity device, right? It tells the car who I am. So actually, they should have made it as a wristband, right? They made it that way because we were familiar with, with car keys, but it really should just be a wristband, right? Because it stays in your pocket. It stays in your purse, right? And so the kids make fun of me when I walk to the car and go, open sesame. Because <laughs> I no longer have to do anything. I just, when I walk to the car, I don't have the key, it won't open. And when I walk toward the car with the thing in my pocket, it opens. So it does something kind of like a car key, but it doesn't. The point is, is that I had to change. This new thing came along, and you can hand it to me, but if I try to use it like the old thing, I haven't actually learned anything. Right? Learning is about readjusting your assumptions, what you thought you knew, what you brought to the table before. And so that's really what we're in the business of doing, is helping people learn how to change over and over again. Um, so uh, this relates to, to our world where our, you know, our relationship to knowledge has fundamentally changed. Right? <clears throat> Many of us remember the world, um, the old world, where knowledge was reliable, relatively, um, but also relatively scarce. Right? This thing called the encyclopedia. Right? So if you wanted to find something, you went to this place, knowledge was relatively reliable. Now you live in the opposite world, where knowledge is abundant, it's on your phone, it's everywhere, and it's mostly cat videos. Right? <laughs> it is mostly garbage. And, and actually, there are lots of seats in front, and I promise not to make it uncomfortable for you. Um, right, so, so this relationship to knowledge has changed and it's confused people because right, people used to believe um, that you know, if you knew more, you were smart. And you know, there's some truth in that, right? Knowing more is good. But it's the smartest person is the person who really knows how to change his or her mind. That's what smart means. Smart is not about accumulating more. It's about the ability to change your mind. And why that's important is because we now are so confused about this, we, we call this thing a smartphone. As if it were smart, right? It knows more than you. It's true. There is more access to the world's information on your phone than ever before. But that does not make your phone smart. Smart is the ability to change your mind. So <clears throat> that's really what we're in the business of doing. And in fact, I put the exercise equipment up here because it's a great metaphor for how this works, right? Um, more is not always better, right? If I give you an exercise bike for every room of your house, am I helping? <laughs> right? I can, so I give you all this information on your phone, great, fantastic. Ultimately, you've got to get on the bike, right? You've got to get on the machine and do the work. The person who does the work does the learning. So again, think about that. Learning is about change. Learning is also about doing the work, getting on the machine, doing the work. So there's a job for somebody called a fitness coach. What does a fitness coach do, right? Get on the bike. <laughs> right. well, well, yeah, okay. But, but a fitness coach knows something about your body, knows something about exercise, knows something about the equipment. But mostly you pay a, an exercise fitness coach to, to know you, to get to know you. The first, so before we get on the bike, let's talk about you. Why are you here? What do you want to do, right? Let me understand what, what, motiv what motivates you to do this thing. You want to run for re-election? Fewer cheeseburgers, a little more exercise, right? That, that's, that's what a fitness coach does, right? Oh, you, you want to be an emergency room doc? Oh, more anatomy, right? So, so faculty calling themselves professors, right? That's old, that's, that's, that's back in the day when knowledge was scarce. We could profess, it had value. But professing no longer has the same kind of value because your phone can profess. Our real job, we are cognitive coaches because we can't do the work. Only the students can do the work. So once you realize that, you realize that teaching is really a design problem. It's a, pedagogy is about how to motivate other people. The best fitness coach is not the person with the biggest biceps. Because watching you do push-ups is not that effective. <laughs> watching you do intellectual and mental push-ups, wow, you are so smart, you know so much, it doesn't really help, right? 
But if your assignments are such that I do more work, I do more problems, I do more practice, wow, then you're really a good coach. Right? You got me to do more push-ups. That's really what we're about. It's a design problem. So, um, so I start with that. Um, and then I said, well, what, well what, what are the skills we're trying to teach? What else are we trying to do? So I show this to parents, um, uh, actually for all the open days, because parents, of course, think you know, the liberal arts are um, <clears throat> liberal and about art. And so uh, what do employers actually want? Well, look at this. They want problem solving. We do that, check. Ability to work with others of diverse backgrounds. Critical thinking, right? Okay, this is the, this is the what's one survey. Here's a different survey. This is the Davos survey. Ooh, complex problem solving again. Critical thinking, creativity. Um, this is the one that the AAC and U commissioned, the third one, critical thinking, analytical reasoning skills, right? Complex problems. So there's a pattern here, right? So we think, okay, we do this, but we also do it through the guise of content, right? We start with, oh, we're going to teach you philosophy or history, and that's where parents get confused. So if we start with, well, well this is actually what we do. We're going to teach your, your, your children to change, um, how to learn new things, how to be prepared for the jobs of the future. Um, why the jobs of the future? Because they're not the jobs of the past. They're not actually the jobs of the present, right? Um, I have a daughter in New York City who's a director of social media, because every 25-year-old should be a director. And, uh, <laughs> but, but, right, so she, but it's also the case that 12 years ago there was no social media, right? There was no such thing. There were no courses in it, because there was no thing. There was no major in it. So 12 years ago there was nothing, and now you can direct it. <laughs> so 12 years from now, what will they be directing? I have no idea, because it hasn't been invented. So the truth is, you can't teach them what they really need to know. Right? We can't teach you the content, the information that you will need for the jobs of the future, because it has not yet been discovered. Think about how liberating that is in terms of choosing your major, right? That's why it doesn't matter, because the actual content that you get in chemistry or anthropology is going to be augmented by a lot of new content and a lot of new other kinds of things. So don't worry about it. Declare a mission, not a major. Because your major really doesn't matter, because the major is most likely to be useless in a few years. This is, a, again, it's only academics. This is a prediction we don't know. But that's the point, we don't know. But their prediction is, from these guys at, at Oxford, is um, that the major most likely to be useless because it'll be done by robots will be accounting and finance. I don't know, maybe. But the point is, if you're, you know, when, they, when they say to you, I have a major for me and a major for my parents, right? I say, well, let's talk about this, right? Do your parents have a crystal ball of the majors of the jobs of the future? Really, really? Do they have some stock tips too? Right? Because I'd love to know what the future is, but I actually don't know what the future is going to be, and neither do you. So don't try to guess, right? Don't bet with your kid's life. But these parents really, they, they, they get a little scared when they talk. So don't, are you, you're betting with your kid's life that accountancy will be, you know, or being an accountant will be the job. But okay, there will be accountants in the future, but they'll be programming robots that do accounting probably. Right? So I don't know what it will be. I do know there'll be people who need to talk to the people about what my, robots, my, my accountant robot's going to do for you. Right? But I have no idea how that's all going to work. So do find your passion. <clears throat> and the reason to find your passion, I know I don't like that cliche either, is because what you're really learning how to do is to change. You're like, wow, I learned something and it changed the way I think. And if you practice that process over and over again, then when you graduate in 10 years ago, you can direct some new thing that hasn't yet been invented. Because what that requires is changing all of your assumptions. So we really are in the business of helping students learn how to change their mind over and over and over again. Um, and that's the, the, the frame that I use. And I call this the learning economy. I do think the information age is over. Part of that's because we have these smartphones and these computers, right? The, the computing power, they are going to know more than we can ever know. They are going to be able to crunch more data than we can ever crunch. So the jobs of the future will all be about being complementary to computers. Right? If, if, if a computer can do your job, it will. Right? Your job is to say, what are the right questions to ask? How do I interface with the computer? How do I ask a question that's non-linear that the computer wouldn't ask? How do I work with other people? Those, that set of, of, of issues is really where the future is going to be. And having, knowing more than you, right? well, yeah, fine, you know more than I do, great. My, comp my phone knows more than you too. <laughs> right? You're not going to win that game because the new economy is not an information economy, it's a learning economy. Um, so, well, so I think of this as a toolbox. And so we've just brought out a new curriculum at Goucher where we got rid of all the distribution requirements. Right? All those 11 intro courses, one of these, one of those. Because right? a bunch of intro courses is not a terribly integrated approach. 
right? So I show this image to parents too and I say, look, physics is a hammer. Hammers are great if you've got nails, right? So if you show up for work and you've got nails, lucky you, right? But suppose today they have screws, right? Well, that's poetry. Oops, right? Or the pliers, right? That in fact, what, what a liberal arts education is, is a toolbox. And each of our disciplines, or different ways of looking at the world, are also different tools that you can apply to problems. And so what you really want is not one really big, shiny, gold-plated hammer, your physics major. What you really want is a box full of different kinds of tools that allow you to do this. So we took that and we said, okay, what's our new curriculum gonna be? What do employers want? I have no idea what the jobs of the future, I have no idea what the right major is, so we're gonna require three years of writing, because whatever job you're gonna have, you're gonna need to be writing, so I know writing is critical. And two, we got rid of calculus, because I don't know you need calculus. We still offered for the science majors, of course, but we were instead, two required se semesters of data analytics for all students. Because I know for sure that your future involves working with data working with computers, working with spreadsheets. If you graduate without a spreadsheet knowledge, you are, you are gonna be handicapped. So what you don't need is calculus, what you don't need, you do need statistics, you do need numeracy, you're gonna have to pay taxes and get a mortgage, but you're gonna have to know how to deal with data analytics. Now we let you pick the topic and we integrate it into your major, but data analytics is critical. And the third leg of this is cultural competency, right? Working in complex problems with people who are not like you. So we require 100% all of our students to study abroad, and we still require two semesters of foreign language, right? And the point is, don't you have to pick the right language? No, you don't have to pick the right country either, right? You have to have been out of the country and experienced discomfort and change. So I, the suggestion is, where do I go to study abroad, depending on what I want to do, it doesn't matter. Go someplace that's as uncomfortable as you can stand. Right, if you've been to London three times, don't go there again, you've been there. Go, come with me to Timbuktu, right? Let's go to some place that makes you uncomfortable <clears throat> because the process of learning is discomfort, adjustment, rethinking about how all the integration of all the other pieces, right? That's what we're trying to accomplish. So it doesn't matter where you go, but go some place that makes you feel uncomfortable. So that's it. That's our new curriculum. Well, okay, there's one exception. So we got rid of all the distribution requirements, but we still want to expose you to different things in the toolbox. So we created a series of four seminars in complex problem solving with people who are not like you. Right? So it's mostly group work, it's complex problems. We have one of the more diverse campuses uh, in the nation, so we want to people to work together, so we created group work as part of what we do. We offer 40 different topics a semester, and you pick the topic. Right? So I've got some samples of topics. Right? And the point is, is that right, any of these topics are gonna require different disciplines. Right? So um, we have a new course on immigration. Well, where does immigration start? Well, where did borders come from? Oh, that would be history. Right, because we didn't always have, this. not on the map, right? That comes from politics and history. Oh, politics, I have to learn about that too. Well, who comes? Oh, that would be economics. You'll have to take some economic, right? So they're, they're all team taught, right? They're put together by a group of faculty. Yes, it's expensive, they're small classes. Um, but the idea is that a group of three or four people design them and one or two people can deliver them and then have somebody come in and do a guest spot. But the idea is that I want to expose you to economics in the context of your interest. Because learning really starts with what matters to you. All teaching starts with, again, it's like the fitness coach. It starts with what matters to you. It ends with what matters to the teacher, perhaps, but it doesn't start there. It starts with why are you here in the gym, right? Because think about it. Fitness coaches like gyms, right? That's why they look that way. That's why they're there. They like the gym. You like the library. It's the same thing. <laughs> I don't like the library. I don't want, why, right? You, you like school so much you're still here. <laughs> That's weird, that's not normal. So we're a terrible model for how to design classes and motivation because we were motivated, right? So the fitness coach doesn't need motivation, right? But this guy who's just wanted enough, ah, oh, I hate exercise. He needs motivation, right? So that's really what we're about. So you pick a course that motivates you, <clears throat> that interests you, and then by the way, if you take the course on food, there's gonna be some biology. Right? But rather than having to say, you have to take a biology course, say, well, what's the problem that you want to solve? What are your passions? So there are four of these seminars over four years, um, and they get progressively more complex. So it's not about topics, it's about more thinking and, 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 and more complex thinking over the four years. So that's the first part. So learning is about change. <clears throat> the second bit is that your brain actually is in your body. 
Right? Your brain is an organ in your body. So your body actually matters. So when students arrive at Goucher, <clears throat> the first thing, they move into their dorms and they all meet in the gym and they meet their RAs and they meet their groups. And then before they do that, they meet me. And they say, so hi, you're gonna see me on campus, I'm the president. And so when I say, hey, how are you? You're gonna say, sweet. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, of course, an eye-rolling gag on our campus, but I hear a lot of sweet all day long, and I say, because I want you to remember that learning is sweet. Learning is about sleep, water, exercise, eating, and time. And I'm sorry, faculty, tea is not for teaching. <laughs> I wish it was, right? But again, like fitness, the person who does the work does the learning. The time on task is actually what matters. The amount of time you spend working and studying and going to class is the thing that most determines whether or not you do well. Great teachers are, are, are useless to the next T, probably, right? But real great teaching is about getting you to do sweet, right? Getting you to spend time on task. My assignments are better if they get you to do, spend more time on them. So sleep is the most important thing, because no matter how good the teacher is, it doesn't matter if you're asleep, right? Um, we, we miscalculate this because we have coffee and we think, oh, I'm feeling fine, right? Um, no, <clears throat> right, six hours of sleep a night. Um, after two weeks, you're as sleep deprived as somebody who's been up for 48 hours straight. You're distracted by the coffee and by the girls and the boys and the other stuff, but it turns out cognitively you are seriously impaired, right? So if you really want to improve student learning on your campus, get them to get more sleep. I'll come back to how to do that, but it is hard. Water. Caffeine is bad for you in the morning, sorry. Right, your cortisol levels are rising anyway to naturally wake you up. And by the way, your brain is dehydrated when you wake up. Right? You've just gone eight hours without water. Your brain is dehydrated. You can't make BDNF. You can't actually learn. There's nothing a teacher can do if you can't actually make neural connections. Right? You don't have the protein in your brain that you need. So the first thing you can do, water. This is easy to run. This half of the room gets eight ounces of water before every, every eight o'clock class. This, this class, you can do whatever you want, have your coffee, whatever half a grade higher in a week. I mean, it's, it's instant. I mean, water in the morning will make a difference to your students. Now, how to do it up is the right, the nudge bit. But we know the brain, we know that the brain in the morning especially needs water and coffee is bad for you. It, 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 it hurts your learning, right? It does perk you up, makes you feel more alike, but you don't make neural connections. You don't remember as much a week later. Sleep, water, exercise. Exercise also helps you make BDNF, right? It also helps you um, remember things, right? Study chemistry, four hours later, you do moderate exercise. You actually remember more than the person who didn't do more exercise. Even four hours after you've studied. So fitness, wellness, that really does matter for, not just this leadership, other social stuff, it actually helps your brain. Right? A little bit of walking, right? Stopping in between things to go walk around, again, stimulates the brain. Um, eating, what, what you eat, what you put in your body does affect your brain. Right, it's an organ in your body, so time. So sleep, water, exercise, eating, and time, sweet. It's easy to remember, and if you forget, it's in Teaching Naked Techniques in the introduction. Um, so, so I've thought a lot about this design process and about how the brain works. And so, again, pedagogy and teaching is really about designing a way for students to be motivated to do work. That's really what we're trying to do. So as faculty, we always start here in the middle, right? We start with our content because it matters to us. Does it matter to students? Right, well, it might, it might not. So your first job is to figure that students actually are outsiders, literal outsiders. They start on the outside of the, of the circle. They're trying to get in and join your club, but they start out here with, what do I know? What's my first contact? What's my exposure? What's my motivation? Right, so if you don't know that, and by the way, that person on the internet, that talking head with a TED Talk or a Coursera or edX, they have as much content as you do, maybe more, and maybe a Nobel Prize, right? But they don't know your students, right? They don't know what motivates you. Why are you in my class? What, what, how, what, what's the local sports team you're passionate about, right? They don't know your students. So knowing this is critical, because this is actually where your students start, right? So your students have to figure out what's their motivation for this? Do they really want to do it? What do they already know? Are they afraid? Again, let's go back to your brain, right? You have this thing called an amygdala, right? You, you check all inputs to your brain for threat. Right? That's why it's in the back near the spinal cord. So everything goes to your brain in, in a paired signal. Right? Because what happens if there's a panther charging towards you? Right? You don't want to, the part of your brain that goes, wow, that panther is beautiful. <laughs> Boom! Right? You, you, right? you get eaten. So what, so what your amygdala does is it says, you know, ignore the beauty of the panther. 
Ignore the intellectual content here. Run! <coughs> right? So you do that for everything. So if I perceive that your content is threatening or your class is not comfortable, I literally can't learn. My brain shuts down the front part, the neocortex, which by the way is still growing. Right? So if you ask a 20-year-old, um, should you set your hair on fire? They take longer to answer than you do. <laughs> Right? We can measure that. Their, their, their judgment, their neocortex is still growing. Right? So, so knowing this, right, knowing that everything is, is, is threat assessed in your brain, I'm going to give you an assignment. I would like you to go to the Chicago Police Department on Saturday, um, and I'd like you to do an eight-hour mandatory workshop on racial bias and profiling. It will be mandatory for them, um, and you will be the teacher. How are we going to judge your effectiveness? By the way, you have seven PhDs and you've written a thousand articles. You are the world's expert. Is that going to help? Your content knowledge doesn't help because what do you have to overcome? Right? It's like driver ed, right, when you get a ticket. Right? They don't want to be there. So where do you start? Well, I, I call this the entry point, right? Where do you start? Probably not with racial profiling. So where's a good place to start? And don't say donuts. <laughs> It's not a bad idea, but where would you, right? Think about some, some, what are some entry points? What's the first thing I have to do with the Chicago Police Department and all of my, my room full of people who are look, giving me the look you're giving me right now, right? I, I want people to relax. I want the member engagement, motivation before learning. So how do I motivate them and engage them? What can we talk about? Their experiences. Their experiences, good. What kind of experiences? No wrong answers, yeah? Racial bias. Experiences of racial bias, that's one way to start. Of course, the minute I start talking about racial bias, some of them are going to go, oh, wait, hang on. So experiences, yes, but what other experiences might they have had that are feeling? Yes? Ask them what motivates you to be police. Exactly. What motivates you to be a police officer? Why are you here? That's a great, and, and get them to talk, get them to feel better. What else? Because what I really want to do is connect, remember, what, motivate, what matters to them with what matters to me. So I eventually do, it's not, a, it's not a, just one of those dumb icebreakers, right? I actually do want the conversation to lead to where I, the breadcrumbs to go here. So what about... Sports. Any Cubs fans here? Anybody like the Cubs? How about, how about White Sox? Right? Okay, so White Sox, so if I gave you season tickets to the Cubbies forever, would that be good? You wouldn't take them? They're free. Why not? Right? You like the, right? So let's talk about, so let's just talk about baseball for a while. Right? Because, or let's talk about trucks. Who has Dodge? Who drives a Chevy? Who drives a Ford? Right? I have, I have two brothers-in-law are police officers, and so they're passionate about trucks. And we say, oh, so, so if I gave you the free Ford? No, 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 it's got to be Dodge. Why? Well, because Daddy drove a Dodge. Hmm. Let's talk about that. Right? And without actually going to the place that you're all going, where they're actually going to be, that's a bias that you have. Right? Everybody has a bias, and why do you have that? Right? But the point is, get them comfortable and get them talking about bias, but then when they don't know about it. That's not obvious, was it? Right? That, this is teaching. Right? The, what teaching is about figuring out the design so that people fall into your content motivated without knowing it. That's really what we're trying to do. So we have to start out here, um, but we have to have lots of recall. It turns out that the tests are good, it's the stakes that are the problem, but actually you want lots and lots of recall. Um, you want elaboration, you want abstracting, you want complication, and my, my goal for complication is have it in class, because failure is essential for teaching. Right? Um, and then reflection, which was one of my three R's, right? because ultimately, Change. So one of my uh, pieces of advice to faculty, now that we have this new technology that's cool, never, ever, ever put a grade on anything and hand it back to a student. You should never put grades on hard copies that you hand back. That's what computers are for. Put it in Blackboard Canvas and hide them. So I'm going to give you feedback. Feedback is essential for learning. Grades are not. So I need grades for graduate school, other kinds of things. So if you've, if you've spent hours and hours and hours putting feedback on papers, right? You did grade them too, but you mostly put feedback that you want people to read, not stick on their backpack and march out the door angry. Because what happens? B minus, amygdala, emotions, you hate me. I'm not gonna read your comments, because you hate me. And off they go, and they never read them. So here's this, let's try this instead. Here's a paper, read the feedback. Yes, there's a grade on this, but it's hidden, it's in the computer. It'll be visible in an hour. Right now, what I want you to do is read the feedback and then estimate where you lost points. What would you do better next time? And I give them a reflection exercise that I call a cognitive wrapper, one page, to, to, to reflect on how they did, what they did, et cetera. But that's the piece that's always missing, and we don't do it in class. Don't do it, that has to be done in class. Grades you can check afterwards. 
So some of you are going, okay, that makes some sense. The faculty do that. And others of you are going, really? I said, so I have a, a solution for you. Give your faculty puppies. <laughs> Unhouse trained puppies. So you're an expert in pedagogy. You, you're, a, you're a good teacher, you say. Okay, house train one of these. Because if you, I've learned a lot from dog trainers, right? Because it actually is the same thing, right? It is teaching, right? It's the same sequence. You start with motivation and entry point, right? What does your dog know, right? So if your dog is afraid of men, because perhaps in the previous house there was a man in the house who beat the dog, is it the dog's fault? Are you going to help the problem by yelling at the dog? But you've got to figure out, why does the dog not like men? How do I get the dog to like men? The dog doesn't like the collar. Maybe there was a, right, what's the association? What, what do they already know? Wait, what will motivate them, right? I have one dog that's very food motivated. The other one, no, not at all, right? So food doesn't work. Praise works. Kind of like our students, right? Sometimes food works, pizza, free pizza, but praise is really what works, right? So, and that, that cycle of recall, repeat, elaboration, complication, what's a complication for a dog? So I can get you to come, unless there's a squirrel, right? And all of a sudden, right? So, so if a dog is really well-trained, does it matter if there are squirrels, right? The, 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 the you know, a, a seeing eye dog on the airplane isn't gonna bark, because that dog knows that when they're wearing the harness, they're working. And barking is not something you do when you're working. That's actually a fairly complicated set of instructions, right? But you can, in fact, teach a dog how to do that. So if you get your faculty to train some puppies, think about what will happen in the classroom. But to me, that's another metaphor for how this works. Um, and again, I, it's sad to say I've actually learned most of this from dog trainers. Um, so we have new technology. We have a new world. Things have changed. The jobs of the future are unknown. But the good news is thinking is more important. We do that. That's actually what we do. We just have to talk about it in a different way. But integration actually also became more important because the future belongs to either specialists or aggregators. So Harvard, is gonna, Harvard physics department is going to be the specialist. That's fine. Your physics department is probably not going to be the best physics department on the planet. You're an integrator by the fact that you're at this meeting, right? So our ability to integrate is what's going to make us have value for our students. Do you need a, a biology lecture? No, you can go online for that. But the integration of other services, of other learning, of are you changing, are you getting help with the, per all of that other stuff. So integration is really what our campuses are about. And all this also means that design has become more important, right? Because we're now competing with students for their attention. There's lots and lots of content on the internet, other kinds of places. And it's also turned out that social media and marijuana is more potent than it used to be. And so our students are kind of in a haze. For a lot of reasons, right? Anxiety, depression is going up, all that. Actually, I think both of those things are actually, I think both, both the, I mean, marijuana is two and a half times stronger than it was 20 years ago, right? Um, and guess what? For you, it's fine. Smoke all you like. But if you're 18 years old, it, it, you don't grow the same amount of white matter, right? It actually changes how your brain develops, right? Your verbal IQ will forever be, be diminished. It takes 28 days to get out of your system, too. So you don't actually know that it's like, wow, I smoked a week ago and now I'm depressed. I don't know why, right? So how do I design an environment that's going to encourage you to do all of these healthy behaviors, most of which is time on task? So design and choice are of real interest to me at the moment. So I start with um, <coughs> this, this, this survey from economics. You've heard of um, right, nudge theory. Just uh, Richard Thaler just won the Nobel Prize in economics for this idea. Uh, choice architecture has been, right, healthcare has been using this a lot because it turns out if you go to the doctor and they say, here's your appointment, it's a year from now. You can change it if you like, but I've made you a return appointment as opposed to come back when you like. In a year you should call us and make an appointment. Who's more likely to go back to the doctor in a year? The person with the, um, with the appointment, right? The choice was made for you. So we know that if you're selling six types of jam and you're selling 24 types of jam, more people stop over here at the table with 24 types of jam. Wow, lots of choices and flavors. But fewer people buy. In fact, you, buy ten, you sell 10 times as much jam over here because you've got fewer choices. And I can handle that. I can't handle 24 choices. I just I won't buy anything. Now think about what you, the first thing you do to students. Hi, welcome to college. Here are 5,000 courses. Pick four. It's a terrible idea. It's overload, which is why they pick four art classes or what, I mean, right? They don't know. So you rely on advisors to help solve the problem. I got a better way for you. Ask them two questions and then give them a schedule. You can change anything in your, and you like, but here's your schedule. Two questions. One, do you want to be pre-med? 
two. Are you sure? <laughs> We've actually tried this, right? It's a pilot. We're going to do this for everybody next year because what happens? Mo so we said to students, so here's your schedule. Here, this is, these are your courses. And you could actually, if you wanted to, you could ask a few more questions. You know, do you work in the afternoon? Do you, do you only want to come to, are you a commuter? Do you want to be here two days a week? Right? You, do you like working in the morning? Right? You could give them some other sets of preferences, but here's your schedule. You can change any of these courses. If you don't like any course, you could change all five. But here's a schedule. Guess what most students are going to do? Take the default. So if the default is well constructed, English, math, for whatever, you've just increased your graduation. And we haven't done this for four years, so I can't tell you the outcome. But I am sure this is going to increase graduation on time, because you didn't take four art classes and waste, waste a semester, because you weren't right. Oh my god, I just know what to take. Right? So choice architecture is something that, as institutional leaders, we actually have some control over. Right? So, um, so that's a design choice that we make when we design the institution. Um, um, so <clears throat> I call this <clears throat> um, our approach, this the three R's, as you've heard, relationships, resilience, reflection. And so the question then is, how do we design and integrate for these things? So <clears throat> relationships um, is, is important for a lot of reasons. But if you no don't know the Gallup-Purdue index, you should. Um, but its information has been really vital in helping us understand what happens after college. So what is the single most important thing that happens in college that determines your lifelong happiness, your lifelong financial well-being, your lifelong physical well-being, your divorce rate, right? Finding a faculty <coughs> member who said, I believe in you, right? I think you're going to be a great poet. I think you'll be a great physicist. Finding that person who believes in you, right? Who's also, we've also heard a lot about Carol Dweck and mindset. It's, this, it's related to the same thing. That believing, having somebody believe in you, oh, really, you think I could go to graduate school? You think I could do that? That actually means that you make more money for the rest of your life. You're less likely to be obese. You have more friends. I mean, it, it, it's amazing where this, this ends up um, touching people throughout the rest of their lives. And again, the Gallup-Purdue Index has all sorts of interesting data on how that goes. And so we actually survey our alums because we want to know, you know our, for you know, former women's college goucher, right, our alums make less money than some of yours. Right? We don't have engineering, right? And we had women, right, for, for most of our graduates, um, right? So, so it was really useful for me to say to, to parents, okay, it's true. We have a lot of teachers. We have a peace studies major. We're a former women's college. Our average salary after graduation is, is a little bit lower if you look at the White House scorecard. Thank you very much, White House, right? <laughs> but thanks to Gallup, I can now say, but you know what? Our alums are happier throughout their life and to answer the question, do you have enough money, they're more likely to answer yes. So I can look parents in the eye and say, which would you rather have? Your parents have a lot of, your kids have a lot of money and hate their job? Or your kids say, I have enough money, mom. I make enough money, right? Because I think what parents really want is two things, right? They want a J-O-B for their child, right? Um, they don't want them to live in the basement after college. That's okay, that's normal. And they want them to be happy. So actually that happiness, finding your purpose, sense of, so that, that's related to relationships, not to your major. Your major makes no difference. It's that relationship piece. So at the very time that we know that we just discovered relationships really, really matter, and guess what happens? <clears throat> Students now arrive on college for the first time in history with all of their high school friends <clears throat> with them on their phone, right? So the biggest problem in college, as you know, is now loneliness, right? So what can we do about loneliness? So we can do something. <clears throat> Turns out that <clears throat> you can ask, right, so this is the, this is the data analytics part of the talk. All right. So we have lots and lots of data on where students live, um, where they go um, to eat, you know, whether they swipe to get on the exercise bike, all that kind of big brother stuff. Where, you know, they swipe in and out of the dorm. This is fantastic, right? Great information. So we can ask questions because the data, right, the smartphone doesn't ask questions. It doesn't say, where is the worst place to live as a freshman for graduation rate? Singles, doubles, triples, or quads? Singles. Look at how smart you are. <laughs> Singles, students who are, the, if you live in a single, you're the most likely to leave campus after a semester, right? So, so many colleges are building more singles because students say they want them, right? They want more singles because, again, at this time, they, fewer of them have lived with a roommate, right? More only children, et cetera. You know, they haven't ever shared a bathroom, my goodness, right? So, <clears throat> if you're in a single, you're more likely to be isolated and lonely because what do you do when you're single? You get on Facebook and you talk to your high school friends. You don't actually, we couldn't do that, right? I went to school with a bag of dimes. 
I was told to call home on Sunday. I wasn't going to call any of my friends, right? I called my mother once a week, right? So these days, right, they're talking to their friends six, seven times a day, right? They're texting in class. Who are they texting? Right? Not their, they're, te they're texting their high school friends, right? And of course, Facebook also looks like everybody else is having a better time. This is important because it looks like all of your friends are having a better time at their school. So what's go what we're seeing, transfer rates are going up and where are kids transferring? Closer to home, right? They're also going to state schools because they want to save money, but they're, they're going closer to home because their high school friends are having so much more fun on Facebook. So we're seeing all that happen. So singles exacerbate that. What's the next worst? Doubles, triples, quads. Doubles, triples, or quads going once. Who says triples? Who says quads? Doubles. Okay, so those of you who do not have two siblings, it's triples. Because it's always two against one. Now, can I prove that? Absolutely not, right? That's, that's, that's an explanation, right? <laughs> the data tells us that triples have lower retention. My explanation is, you know, triple, and when I, when I see this, oh yeah, anybody who has two siblings goes, yeah, triples, that's probably, you know, two against one, that's gonna be tough, right? And I had a triple as a freshman, it was two against one the whole year, right? It kept changing, but it was always two against one, right? The three of us were never on, on speaking terms. So, turns out doubles and quads, quads actually have a slightly higher retention rate um, than doubles, but students don't like them as much. So this building is a building built on that theory and some other nudges and data. So I also asked a weird question. Does it matter how far you are from the bathroom? Yeah. The further you are from the bathroom, the more likely you are to graduate on time. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm so glad you've invested your money in your CTL and your improving teaching and your technology. And the truth is, the, f the further you are from the bathroom, that's better. So I actually have parents just go, yeah, look at this, you're right all the way, right? Because what happens? Again, I, I can't prove this, but my, the theory is, um, because the data does show this, right? Because I know where you, where you live. But if you're next to the bathroom, right, you don't meet as many people. You go back and forth to the bathroom, you go back to your room, you get back on Facebook. You're at the end of the hall, and you have to walk a long way to the bathroom. You see lots of people, you see more people, you make more friends, right? So this building has bigger lounges and smaller rooms. These are the smallest rooms we've ever built, and they are narrower than we've ever built. Why are they narrow? Right? These are long, little, skinny rooms. Because as you all know, the, 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 the post office is the new bookstore. Right? Students buy their books online and they go to the post office and they want 24 access, so we actually put in those smart lockers, which did help. Um, but I went to the post office and said, what's the weirdest thing a kid shipped? You know, I said, well, I got, this, I got these four flat screen TVs here. They're giant, so they're gamers, right? So remember the who's bringing the stereo conversation? Now it's, I'll bring the Xbox if you bring the other one. Right, or whatever. So they put them on each wall. So what happens if you put the two TVs on the wall? You have to get on the op away. You can't get far enough away from them in my rooms. So I put bigger screens in the lounges to discourage you from trying to play games in your room. And maybe my best idea of all time, I made the internet faster in the lounges. <laughs> right, you can all go home now, right? I mean, so. You can see, so they have these, so this, this, the middle of the building has these big lounges. So in fact, the staircase is like, so you come up the staircase, you have to walk through the lounge to get to the other side of the staircase. And then the staircase goes around. So you have to walk through four lounges to get to the fourth floor. There are faculty living here. There are only two ways into the building. You can come in here past mom and dad's house, right? Or in through the main thing and up the, the staircase, right? The data tells us, <clears throat> those of you who have kids should know this. Um, <clears throat> when you're home, your kids behave better. Duh, right? If, if, they, if you're home sleeping and they have a party, it's still better than if you're not there. If you're not there and they're having a party, check the booze when you get back, right? I mean, so just, have, just knowing there's an adult in the, in the first floor actually reduces drinking incidents, right? So, um, and that does seem to be the case. But, but the lounges, there's also this, this, um, this glass right in here, right? That's the laundry room, right? Because I want you to do laundry. Really, it's good. But I don't want it in the basement because I want it to be a, a social. So we built a laundry room in the middle of the building. And there's a kitchen on every floor. These are really big lounges, right? Um, and the bathrooms, of course, I told the architects, maximize the distance to the bathrooms, right? The architects who built this hotel did the opposite. They were told, minimize the distance to the bathroom, so, right? So, so we've done all those things, right? And again, I think the internet's probably the most important of them. But you know, we did all of that narrower rooms. <coughs> so, 
Half of our first, first year class last year lived here. The other half lived in three older buildings across the way. Nice doubles, similar building right next to it, so not physical location, wasn't that matter. Um, so the GPA in this building, so the GPA in the old building for freshmen, 3.0. GPA in this building, 3.3. That's a pretty substantial difference. About a 10 to 12% increase in, in retention first to second year. 10 to 12% more students in this building came back than the ones right next door, um, which is not that old. It's actually a building people like. We've saved that building. Uh, we didn't tear it down because it's a, it's a good enough building. So, so that's a nudge. So that, that's an example of how we can construct and integrate and build community. Um, so, uh, so last thing I'll say about this is that the, the reflection piece is the hardest piece to get. Right? I talked about you know, my cognitive wrappers. Um, but it turns out that Rest is not idleness for your brain. This is your brain resting, which means you're not on Facebook, right? This is a brain that that's all, the, all the stimulus has been taken away, and you were just told to relax, meditate, go to church, go to synagogue, right? Do a day of rest, whatever. And guess what bits of the brain are lit up, right? Those are the parts of the brain where you think about empathy, um, your moral judgment, right? Your ethics. That's what's lit up. So when you're not doing anything, you're actually developing sympathy and empathy and thinking, thinking in ways that are stimulating parts of your brain that are important. What happens if I allow you to do Facebook while you're doing this? Those shut off immediately, right? So we do have a problem that we have to get, and it's not just you know, getting them to read Dostoevsky and reading them longer passages. It, it, they are going to be less empathetic if they spend their whole lives on Facebook, partly because they need downtime. They need reflection. So, we can teach all the classes we want, but we have to build into what we sell to people, what we do, right? We have a residential campus where we have other kinds of facilities, athletics, et cetera. We have to build in reflection that's, that's meaningful to students um, to, to really develop the kind of citizens that we want. And that's not about content at all. Um, so I'm calling this the three C's, because I like threes apparently. Um, and so this is the how. So the philosophy is the three R's, but how are we going to do this? Curriculum, I've talked about that today. Uh, community, right? Helping students to create more community. Um, and the third C is careers, right? Because I think the next thing you have to do is actually um, integrate a careers approach. Um, and careers doesn't just mean, you know, a CEO, you know, et cetera. It, it does mean that, it does mean a JOB. But it might mean working in the not-for-profit world. It might mean that you found your passion um, working for Greenpeace. <clears throat> and so a lot of us have community-based learning how do we integrate that with our career? Because otherwise you have the careers over here and the kids who are interested in the not-for-profit never, because oh, I, I don't want to go over there. In fact, we rejected the, we were going to call this the Career Education Office, CEO. And the kids are like, no, we don't like that because I don't want to be a CEO. Because they don't actually know that what they want to do at Greenpeace is become the CEO of Greenpeace, right? And so, so how do we combine study abroad, all the transformative stuff? So I'm calling it careers for, for parents. <clears throat> but the truth is, it's all the transformative stuff the high impact practices. We have to integrate that into as many of the students' experiences as we can. So um, all of this leads me to this idea that what we really do is create voracious self-regulated learners. The self-regulated bit's important, right? Because, I, so I started off in music. I was a you know, piano teacher. And so a lot of my colleagues are like, they're all gonna sound like me. You can recognize my piano students. Not me, you can't recognize my piano students because they all sound like themselves. My goal was to help you sound like you, to figure out what you, what your, find your voice, which means you might finger things differently than I do, you might you have different hands, you have a different, et cetera. What is it that you want to do? And eventually, I want to make myself obsolete, right? Because when you graduate, I want to go away. Yeah, send me your, your programs and what, I want to hear what you're doing. But you should be the one that says, you know, this piece isn't quite ready to perform yet, you need a little more practice. Or, you know, you've been doing this for six years, that one's ready to go. Right? Don't just sit on that one. Go! Right? You have to make those decisions. I helped you for four years, and now I want to be obsolete. So th we want to make ourselves obsolete as teachers. We want students to be able to find their own voice and be able to learn how to change their own mind, to learn new things and change themselves after they leave. So in a learning economy, that's what's essential, and that's what I think we do. The truth is, I actually think all of us in this room are thinking about, yeah, we do all that. But when we talk about recapturing the narrative in America about liberal arts, right, and the marketing people all say, don't talk about liberal arts, and don't talk about liberal arts. So, okay, you know, I can do this for an hour without talking, without mentioning the words liberal arts, but it's liberal arts. 
right? But I am creating self-regulated learners who are prepared for the jobs of the future. And that's the narrative that I think will work. And the value that I think we add is that <clears throat> why should I spend more money to come to your expensive residential campus when I could go to community college or state college down the road is because that experience is less integrated, right? That experience is disaggregated. You can get that experience. It's true, it's cheaper, but you can actually get it for free online. If all you want is content, you can get lectures to your heart's content for free online. If you come to us, we're going to be integrated. We're going to be worried about your brain, about your reflection, about what you eat, how much you sleep. What I really want to do is turn the internet off at midnight because I know I could improve student learning, student empathy. I can, I can improve so many things. So just the question is how far away from campus I have to be when I do that. <laughs> we tried cell phone free dinners. They hated it. <laughs> now, so here's a new one. We have a new dining hall, and the, what the big decision I have to make, the so students are opposing me on this too, because what they want is to be able to take all their food home with them back to the dorm, right? They want grab and go. They don't want to eat, right? They want clamshells. So I want to limit the number of times a week they can use the grab and go and say, you have to eat in the dorm three, four times a week. No! Maybe once. How about five? No, right, so we're having, literally having a negotiation about how many times a week you have to eat with other humans. Because otherwise, many of the students would eat 19 meals or 20 meals a week in, in front of their computer at their desk, which is why their keyboard looks like that and doesn't, it's sticky, right? So, right, so but, but to me, right, that's a key decision, right? If running a liberal arts college is not just about classes and curriculum, it's about how do I get students to eat together? Well, I have a dining hall. I could change, I could say them, set up the cards so that your card's not working. You've eaten, you've taken food out seven times this week. It'll work, but you have to eat here. You have to go upstairs and eat actually in, with other people, right? That's a nudge, and so I think that's the future for us because it's the integration and the aggregation of our services that is really what provides the value. It's not just the content. Thank you very much. All right, I think I left a few minutes. Did I, did I do this right? Okay, so. Questions? Rotten Tomatoes? Yes, please. I, there's, is, there a, there's, there's, is there another? I think I'm, I'm tethered to this. I apologize. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Um, that was really quite inspiring. Um, I have a question about the way you're outlining what's happening to the profession of professing, which, as it's been practiced, you're suggesting is becoming obsolete to a certain extent. If learning has changed, how do you inspire your faculty to also learn? <laughs> Give them puppies. Um, no. <laughs> so, so you're right. So one, I do think that, in fact, the, the switch in names from professor to cognitive coach is important. Um, because I actually think that one of the issues, uh, I, am, I think that the, the role of faculty is changing and will need to change substantially more. Right. The reason we had content experts on all of our campuses is because there was no other way to get medieval content in the middle of Nebraska. Right? Libraries and people, you didn't have the internet. Right? Now that we have all these other open resources and other kinds of things, the job is shifting. And so uh, I do think that you know, one of the things you know, I hear about the administrative bloat and the too many staff because you have to have more psychologists and psychiatrists and well, you know, all that other stuff, it's true. Uh, so, but faculty could do some of those jobs. Right? I do think the nature of faculty work, if you think of your job as a cognitive coach, if you think of your job as a mentor, so one of our other plans is we are trying to separate the transformational from the transactional in advising. So at a small college, right, people don't like data because, well, we know all our students. Well, we think we know all of our students. Right? But the truth is, so when students come to you, they want to register for classes, and right, this, uh, or they want to withdraw or drop a class. There's all this transactional stuff. You know, I don't like my roommate. And so if, as an advisor, you don't really want to deal with any of that. Right? You just want to send them on their way. But you think, oh, I've got to find you before 5 o'clock to sign my withdrawal form. In fact, you don't have to do that. That could all be, so, but that piece, in fact, they want to be advisors. What they really mean is they want to be mentors. <clears throat> right? What they don't want to do is be transactional gatekeepers. Right, and say, you know, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to check with the housing office, et cetera. You should have another office for transactions. That's right, but the transformational stuff. So again, what's the first thing a fitness coach do? It's to be the first thing you do with your advisees. Who are you? Why are you here? 
right? Are you first generation? You know, are you, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And all, that, all that kind of mentoring stuff and the what classes should you take? Yeah, I might give you a suggestion, but I don't want to be, I don't want to have to look, flip through the catalog going, wait, wait, I, I don't know who the right English professor is because I'm in the physics department, right? That, that's actually not where the value is anyway. And so, yes, I want faculty advisors because, again, they all want it, but would you, wouldn't you be happier not doing some of the transactional stuff? So the question is how to, how to get this role. So here's another way to do it. Right, we often have annual reports for our faculty, right? What did you do this year? What's the first thing you do? You say, well, how many classes did you teach? Don't make them do that. You know that, right? Auto-populate the annual report with how many students in which class, right? The FTE count, you are the you're the keeper of the, of the data. I'm going to tell you how many FTEs you had this year. Then the second thing you ask is, how much research did you do, right? What, what did you publish? Well, that sends a message. Research is important. Well, it is, but actually, no, less so. Right? The truth is, how many lacrosse games did you go to? How many plays did you go to? How many dance recitals did you attend? So that needs to be up near the top, and it needs to be a drop-down menu. So did you go to the all faculty meeting? Did you go to the student you know, night, whatever? Right? So can you provide incentives for the other things that matter? Um, living in a dorm, um, you know, but just literally, I tell you, know, going to a lacrosse game. Right? So first of all, we know that students learn more when they, th when they think that you care about their learning. Right? Notice it's a perception. You don't have to actually care. But, but, but we know students actually do learn more when they perceive that you care. So when you show up at their lacrosse game, two things happen. One is you're giving the perception that you care, which is good. They, learn, they will learn more. They will come back. But also, you learn about them. Oh my gosh, you're really good at that. I had no idea you had this other talent. I just thought you were this guy sitting in the back of the room on Facebook. Right? You actually create a relationship. I learned some, So there are all sorts of... Your teaching will improve if you get out of the classroom. Right? Your office hours should not be in your office. You know, all, so there are a lot of those things. But you're right. You know, there are some faculty who are going to, it's the same three thirds. They're the third who will be huh, interesting, the third who will hate it, and the third who will like, what'd you say? So you know, I, there's no magic bullet here. This is certainly the hardest part of the job. Um, is, but I, you know, it's creating nudges for them, too. How do I create structures? What, what can I take away from you? So you have more time for the stuff that matters. How can I incentivize the stuff that matters? Yes? Um, so you, you mentioned like sweet and tackling loneliness and reflection. But what are the things that a community college, you mentioned community college, what are things a community college could do to adopt these that we don't have as much control over, over the environment? What are the things that matter to colleges who don't have that? Absolutely. So, um, so <clears throat> all these things are equally important, and you just have different tools. Um, so again, if I'm registering students at a residential college, I don't need to ask, do you want you know, mornings or afternoons? If I'm registering students at a community college, <clears throat> and I'm going to give you an automatic schedule, I need to know, do you have kids? Are you at home at night? You know, what are you, what are your, what's your time frame? Can you be here five days a week or only two days a week? Um, building community still matters. So what can you do on campus that encourages students to come when they're here? Um, but faculty virtual office hours, right? The biggest thing you can do is to not hold your office hours in your physical office. Hold them online so the students who just put their kids to bed can now still get on and, and get help when they need it. That's actually true for everybody because when students most need help is Sunday night. Right? That's when they actually do the work. So a text on Sunday night that says, hey, remember that homework that's due tomorrow? Skip problem number six if it's hard, right? Because I was one of those kids who I worked through the problems in sequence because my mother said so, right? She didn't know any better. So if I got stuck on number six, I stayed on problem number six forever. So a text from the professor on a Sunday that said, hey, you know, number six is the hard one. If you're stuck, skip it. That would have changed my life. <laughs> so, so using social media, using Twitter, or tech, finding other ways to connect with people, building, building virtual communities, um, which could also be synchronous, right? You can do, we're, I'm gonna have office hours Monday night at 9 o'clock on Facebook, right? That's going to get a different group of students to come. That actually works on residential campuses, too, um, because they're in their underwear back at their room. Um, they've just woken up. And <clears throat> but for a community college, that that's actually might be the time, you know, so figuring out when are the times that you, you know, ask students, when do you need help? How can I help you build community? Um, it might be that you need a dining hall for one day a week, that you have, you have a community meal um, on, you know, Thursday lunch. Um, but, but it is, I think it's specific to the campus and, for, and also your neighborhood, your state, your, you know, what, is the, what are the things that matter there? Um, being regional, um, really understanding what matters to people. Yes? Yeah, I just have a question about the sleep. So 
the National College Health Assessment, we look at that data, we've done surveys every year, and our students on our campus are getting eight to nine, ten hours of sleep a night. And so I thought, sleep's not a problem until last semester a student said, oh, well, I get a three-hour nap in the afternoon, and then I, another nap right before I go out, and then I sleep a couple hours before the morning. Do you have any information or data on that type of sleeping in terms of retention or... Yeah, well, yeah, I, I don't, I, I've not seen data that says most students are sleeping eight or nine hours a night. Um, they do sleep more often during different parts of the day, but, but most of the data I've seen says students are sleeping six hours on average, um, which means they are sleep deprived, which is why when they go home for the holidays, they sleep for two weeks. Right, because your body, can, your body will try to catch up. It does, it does build up. A, there is a sleep deficit, and you don't know it's there because right, you get excited about it. It's like being hungry, right? You can, be, you can be hungry and not know it because you just won the Nobel Prize, right? It's like, oh my God, I'm so excited. You forget that you're hungry. Sleep works the same way. You're not always attuned to how cognitively impaired you are. So you may have been sleeping eight hours the last two nights, but if you had six hours a night the, night you know, the week before that, you're, st you're still impaired. Um, it's true, there is more napping, but it turns out the 15 minute nap is the best nap. Uh, the longer nap isn't as good, and it, it, you, you do end up in a fog the rest of the day. So another thing we know, right? Space between classes would improve learning. If you want to improve learning, you should put 15 minutes between each class and have nap rooms. <laughs> now again, that's not a practical thing to do, but it turns out that having classes back to back, right, again, we can measure this too. Classes back to back impair learning because your brain is full. It's like I've got to download, I've got to move some of this. This is also what sleep does. Sleep takes, the hippocampus stores the short-term memory and then it writes it to the hard drive right, in the rest of your brain at night. If you don't get eight hours, and most of that work happens in hours seven and eight. So what, what happens if you get six hours of sleep? You just wipe it, you just wipe the RAM clean. And you start off, so you for, you for, let's forget everything you learned yesterday. If you take classes back to back, three, you know, three hours in a row, again, you have overload. You, you need processing time in between classes. So spacing out classes is good. Um, so again, I think there are things you could do with the schedule. I'll, I'll put a lot of this in the new book. I'm trying to experiment and think about these things. But these are, right, these are things we need to be experimenting with in, in publishing and figuring out what works. But, but those are things that do seem to have a, a much bigger impact in some ways than changing pedagogy. Um, because pedagogy only works if your students are awake. Got one, do I have one more? Okay. Uh, there's such a rise in anxiety and depression in students these days, and I was wondering, uh, you mentioned resilience in your abstract, do you have anything that you want to add to that on what you might be doing to increase resilience? Great. So, so indeed, so anxiety and, and is, is certainly increasing in our students. Um, but I want you to think about something else. Part of the reason why anxiety is increasing is because a lot of students who didn't go to college 20 years ago can now go to college, partly because of medications. right? In part, so, so in some ways, you're seeing students you would not have seen 20 years ago because they wouldn't have been functional in college. So we are seeing, but we are seeing more of these students and they are asking for more services. It does challenge faculty. Um, you have to educate faculty on what accommodations they do and do not have to do. Because some faculty will say, I'm not making any accommodations, and that's a violation of the law. And other faculty will say, oh my gosh, you can do whatever you like and take as much time. I and mean, that's not um, required either. So figuring out, so faculty need more training in what accommodations they do or don't have to do. And, and what it means when a student comes to you and says, my real, I'm thinking of killing myself. What do you do, right? You, everybody needs to understand, you know, who can give counseling, who's not a counselor. These have become much more, again, it's back to your question about faculty roles, right? You know, I may think I didn't have any training in psychology. It doesn't matter. When a student comes to you and asks you a question about their anxiety, right, and then they kill themselves, you might end up in court. So you need to pay attention to this. Um, so these are, these are new and important issues. So resilience is, in fact, the magic R. It's the one parents are most concerned about, right? They, they want to say, here are my kids, fix them. I, 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 they don't actually say those words, but you can tell they're thinking it, um, right? Because my kid has anxiety, and they, so you're the perfect school for them, because you'll, right? And so, um, so, so we, we've started a new orientation just for parents. We've done two, so first is we make them spend the night in the hotel, right? Because when the, it was the one day we were having to drag them out of the parking lot, we have a whole crying zone. So, because some of it's the parents' problem. So we make the parents spend the night in the hotel. So we say, you'll see your kids tomorrow, right? Johnny's over there. It's okay that you don't text them now. But we actually separate them. And then we have convocation the next morning. And then we have a special orientation for parents. And I do a whole talk on resilience. And I say, look, you brought them here for the three hours. You want them to become more resilient. I need your help, right? So I'll make a deal with you. And this is, this is one of, this may be your last one. was one of your lines about, you know, if, if, if you don't believe everything they say about me, 
I won't believe everything they say about you. <laughs> and whoever I stole it, one of you has invented that and I stole it, it's, but it's brilliant, so thank you. Um, uh, Right, so I say, look, so when they call you and they say, oh my God, everything's horrible and the teacher's you know, given us mountains of work over the whatever, just don't call them back, right? And I, I tell them it's a true story. My daughter, I mean, I've, I've just taken the job and she's like, Dad, I get this text, your new healthcare sucks, I'm here at the doctor, they wanna charge me $300, they wanna, uh, it's like, so I didn't answer. <laughs> so 20 minutes later, it's like, man, they wanna charge me 50 bucks, copay, oh my, will you call? I still don't answer. <clears throat> Partly because I was in a meeting, thankfully. Um, and then I see this final text, it's like, okay, figured it out, thanks. <laughs> but again, what we know about the 22-year-old brain is, right, it, it, it gets emotional and responds and wants you to fix it. If you fix it, you're actually getting in the way of their developing resilience. So I tell parents, don't always respond to their texts, the laundry machines are broken, blah, blah, blah. You know, don't, don't call me. <laughs> Right? And so we have a whole program. We do have a parent person who liaises with, with parents. But again, getting parents to recognize, and so we do a special orientation. I, I heard last night at an event here in Washington about some parents who said, you know, we still remember what you told us to let them solve their own problems. And I think, that was news to you? <laughs> but I'll take it, right? I will, so, so I do think you have to have a resilience program that involves your parents and understanding what your parents are, parents are going to do. And then, of course, now when I have this resilience program, I can say to students, this is part of the resilience program, that, that problem with your roommate. And one, so one last one. Here's another new policy nudge. So I had a kid who I didn't like the roommate, wants to move you know, down the hall, and the parents and the lawyers are coming. It's like, oh my god. OK, so finally, it's like, so we look, but Susie down the hall has an empty bed. We, she wants to room with Susie. Can't she just move? So finally, I said, OK, you know what? You win. She can move on one condition. She has to tell the old roommate face to face that she wants to move. Kid is still in the room. <laughs> it's the one thing she couldn't do. So I said, make that a policy. So now it's a policy. Right? It's part of the resilience program. If you want to change roommates, you can't leave in the middle of the night. You can't just pack up your stuff with your parents when your roommate's not there. Right? Or you can't text them. You, know, you can't text them to break up with them. You actually actually have a conversation mediated, we like the RA to be there, so they, but, and say, you know, I want to change roommates. You have to actually say those words out loud. I mean, this is a life skill. This is a job skill, right? You're going to have employees, hopefully, somebody, you're going to manage somebody, you have to give them a hard message. You have to say the words out loud. And that's actually too much for kids. But parents, right, the parent was really mad. The lawyers are like, but I said, look, you brought them here to learn resilience. If they can't actually tell them, how are they going to get a job? You, you need her to do this. And I, you know, so, so having some language like that really does help parents, I think, understand um, that this is what they want, because they do want it for their kids. They just have this urge. Some of them, you know, you, we had the, the helicopter parents, and we had the lawnmower parents, and now we have the Velcro parents, <laughs> right? And so we have to unstick them a bit. So, uh, you know, it's this, but this is hard. So thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. It.